Well, hello, you use. Hello, you. It's me, your resident Yehu. I'm back. <laughs> it's good to be here, and uh, I dare not start naming names, but uh, I have really enjoyed meeting many of you out in the wild this year, here around about town, and uh, it's been great. Uh, I'll just mention a couple people, and if I don't mention you, please don't take offense. I want to uh, just mention Sally yeah. and Jennifer. Yeah. Sally is our chair of the advisory committee at Lane Community College Florence Center. And uh, she and Jennifer are two of the first people I met in Florence. So it's always lovely to, to see you. And thank you for your leadership here today. Yeah. And in fact, if I start going long, just go yeah. something, something like that. <laughs> Now, I shouldn't tell her that. She'll take that a little literally. <laughs> and uh, I, too, am a fan of Councilor Pricer, so it's lovely to, uh, lovely to, to see him here today. And the rest of you that I know and love, thank you for coming as well. Um, I also, I, I briefly mentioned my, my family, but I, I want to tell you just a smidgen about each of them. Uh, my lovely wife, Tammy. I left the ugly one at home. <laughs> They say my better half. Yeah. She's probably my better three fourths, yeah. maybe seven eighths, yeah. something like that. And uh, we're coming up. We're less than a month away from our thirty sixth anniversary. Wow. Yeah. And you're not even thirty six yet. How did you do that? <laughs> uh, my son in law Jason is a school teacher among his many many talents. He's a Renaissance man, and uh, he. He, he diligently has followed my daughter all over the world. They spent a year in France because she wanted to teach English in, Fr in France. And uh, he spent how many god-awful years in North Dakota? <laughs> <laughs> North Dakota, actually, I, I just visited recently, and I thought it was lovely. But uh, I know the winters are a little bleak. And uh, my daughter just finished her uh, Doctor of Physical Therapy degree from the University of North Dakota. So he was there working hard while she was going to school, and uh, they just completed that. She is now uh, a physical therapist on staff at a, a, therapy, a therapist in Eugene, a physical therapy place, whatever they call it. I don't know. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, I texted her when I first got here, when the prelude started, you played a couple of Beatles songs. And she's a big Beatles fan. So I, I said, hurry, you're going to miss the Beatles prelude. <laughs> so so that, was, that was awesome. Um, if you missed my visit last year, it was just about a year ago that I was here. And let me bring you up to speed with a couple of salient points. The first I've already mentioned, we established that I could call you UUs if I let you call me a Yehu. So we've got that covered. And then I revealed three increasingly dire facts about myself. And it's worth pointing them out again. The first thing is, I am a Christian. The second thing, I am, back in the misty past, an ordained minister. And the third thing, shh, I'm an evangelical. <laughs> so thank you for praying the Lord's Prayer today. I felt just right at home. Um, and also, last year, I, I mentioned quickly what, what is an evangelical, because it's much broader than kind of, you know, what we, what we think about. So there's a, there's a great four-point summary, and I'm going to paraphrase it by telling you one thing that evangelicals care about is the Bible. So they take the Christian and Hebrew scriptures seriously, uh, and seriously can go way over here, just over here, um, as we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, they care about the cross, so they assign deep meaning to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and at its core, that means evangelicals believe that one can experience a kind of personal relationship with this power that we call God. And they view God as a giver, a lover, and a cause for hope. Uh, and again, that can, that can look very differently depending on the evangelical you're talking to, but that's its essence. Um, evangelicals actually celebrate change. I, that may be hard for you to believe, but it's true. Uh, this is the notion of conversion and the sense evangelicals have that their ethics and values ought to be consistent with the example of Jesus. Sometimes what we think the example of Jesus looks like might be different, but that's, that's what they think. And then the fourth word is that at heart, evangelicals are activists. Uh, 
that John Wesley, who's the founder of, of Methodism, is one of the earliest evangelicals, and he actually was already an Anglican minister uh, when he had an experience that he describes in these words, my heart was strangely warmed. And it's that warm heart dynamic that is the experience of many of the early abolitionists and suffragists too. So their evangelical faith caused them to do great work in terms of social justice. Uh, the very word evangelical comes from a Greek term used in the Christian scriptures that means good news. So it just kills me. It kills me when I see or hear Christians trumpeting bad news. Um, a couple weeks ago, maybe, maybe, maybe three weeks ago, I took a, a camping trip with some friends up to Mackenzie. And Tammy was supposed to go, but she was sick and stayed home. And I passed this little church on the way, and they, they had a big reader board out front, and it said, Romans 1, guilty. <laughs> I called my wife, I said, I read, read it to her, I said, now there's some good news. <laughs> yeah, so evangelicalism is a really big tent, and you'll find evangelicals at various points along the spectrum between what we might call conservatism, that's my right hand, and liberalism, that's my left hand, although you're sitting that way, so it's like this. Okay? <laughs> Um, and, and that's true actually both politically and theologically, as I'm, I'm sure many of you have found. Last time I was here, I pointed to two great evangelical leaders of the 20th century to describe what has happened in sociological terms. Martin Luther King Jr. and Billy Graham. Uh, King had a kind of outward focus. His great concern was what Jesus himself called the least of these. So the poor, the widows, the oppressed, uh, people who had reaped the, the consequences of systemic evil that came at them from without. Uh, Billy Graham, on the other hand, had an inward focus. He found evil not just in human systems, but said that it also resides sometimes in human hearts, and called on individuals to change their ways of living that brought damage to themselves and others. So as this worked itself out in the 1980s, and I lived through it, I rode the ride, it was a roller coaster ride. So we're talking kind of the Reagan era and beyond. Conservative political operatives began very intentionally to court evangelical leaders in the political spectrum. Uh, and they especially focused on individual evangelical leaders who were in the style of Billy Graham. And they began to identify core issues that had to do with personal responsibility in the eyes of some of these leaders. So anybody remember the moral majority? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that was kind of an outgrowth of this. Um, so the pro-life movement is a good example of what became a hot political topic in, in that era, uh, kind of a marriage of convenience between conservative politics and conservative theology. And then with the advent of cable news and the transition of most of our news content to the internet, it is now not only possible, but likely that most of us, most of us get to pick and choose the radio we listen to, the television we watch, the print and digital news media that essentially reinforces our existing worldview. Um, it's, it's that echo chamber effect. You know, we just keep listening and reading and paying attention to the same thing, the same messages over and over again. So this is true for people on both the left and the right in that sense. Uh, and I consider myself a moderate, uh, and politically speaking, can I say this out loud? I have voted in the past for candidates of both parties. Oh. <sighs> Sorry. We used to celebrate moderates like me. You know, I was that popular swing voter that everybody wanted to know. You know, the uh, the guy that both sides wanted to reach. I care about actually getting things done, and I recognize that requires compromise and a commitment to the common good. We even have a phrase that was no doubt invented by a moderate, finding common ground. But these days we've become increasingly polarized. So today I want to suggest some ways we can find uncommon ground. Yeah, think about that. <laughs> Almost by definition, you use are theologically liberal. Yeah? Yeah. That's, that's not a bad thing. Just, 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 just a, a, a true point. Um, and if we took a poll, I'd be willing to, most to bet that most of us in the room are probably politically more liberal too. We live a little 
more to the left than to the right. Uh, so today, I want to offer myself as a kind of human secret decoder ring <laughs> to help you understand where the religious right is coming from. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> and I'm going to use a strange example, Jesus, to suggest how you might engage in productive conversations with that crazy right-wing uncle that you have to face every Thanksgiving. So, let me introduce you to Jesus the Moderate. A couple of years ago, there was a best-selling book by a Muslim scholar, Riza Aslan, entitled Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. It's a great book, and I actually really appreciate uh, Riza's scholarship and his uh, approach. Uh, he himself is a secular Muslim, and his family includes devout Christians. He was very uh, circumspect, very respectful of Christianity as a faith and of, of Jesus. Um, but I definitely think he got that wrong, and let me explain why. First of all, what is a zealot? What is a zealot? It's more than just you know somebody who's zealous. It has a particular meaning in, in the era in which Jesus lived. So in the first century of the Common Era, the zealots were a fringe political party. They were Jewish nation, nationalists intent on throwing off their colonial Roman governors, and they were insurrectionists who occasionally committed what today we might call acts of terror in the modern era. And Jesus certainly knew about the zealots, and in fact, let me spend just a moment talking about that wacky bunch of people in his life that he called the disciples. So Christians often talk about the 12 disciples of Jesus, but if you look at the various lists of the disciples in the Christian scriptures, the names don't always seem to be exactly the same, and there's a, there's a good reason for that. Looking through these lists, uh, through the lens of their original Jewish context, we find that the individual disciples had first names, surnames, and nicknames. And they're sometimes called by different names in those different lists that occur uh, in the Christian scriptures. For example, uh, one disciple named Nathaniel in one list is called Bartholomew in another. And his full name in Hebrew was likely Nathaniel Bartholomew which we have anglicized as Bartholomew. So he's called Nathaniel in one place, Bartholomew in another place or two. Another disciple is known as Thaddeus, which actually is just a nickname. It was a term of Jewish endearment that roughly means lovey kids. <laughs> True story. I, I can imagine his Jewish grandmother taking him by the, the cheeks and saying, oh, Thaddeus, lovey kids. And every time his grandma you know, went by, He's, mom, mom, not in front of the guys. <laughs> that's, that's how it happened. Uh, there were several disciples with the same common first name. You know, imagine a group of people, and there's always a couple of Bobs and two or three Jims, and the list of the 12 disciples is very much like that as, as well. So they were sometimes distinguished by nick, nicknames. So there was a, a big James and a little James. But these lists of disciples are telling in many other ways, too. First, I must point out, while these they don't appear in these lists of the 12, we know that Jesus had a whole horde of female disciples. Yes, he did. Uh, and that was pretty progressive in his day. It wasn't unheard of, especially in the, the Galilee region. That, that was a more progressive era, actually, in that sense. But that was something that was true of Jesus. Jesus also reversed the usual relationship between rabbi and disciple for his time. Usually what happened is only the best and the brightest could apply to be a disciple of a particular rabbi. So you'd fill out your application, you'd show up with your three letters of reference, uh, and you'd have your interview with a rabbi. And you'd tell this rabbi why you wanted to be their follower. And it was basically kind of like going to grad school. And at the end of the interview, the rabbi would say, no, nah, kid, you ain't got it. And off they would go back to their, their uh, father and mother's home and carry on the trade of their father, or maybe off to community college, which is great. <laughs> I like that. That works for me. Um, but Jesus turned that around. He sought out his own disciples. And in many cases, they probably were guys who couldn't have made it into the other guys' schools. So he was very egalitarian in that way. So for example, Jesus reached out to at least one or two young men who were likely from the wealthy class. Philip, one of the disciples, has a Greek or Hellenized name. 
And that was usually at the wealthier class of Jews living at the time in the, the first century CE. Nathaniel is pictured in the Gospels as meeting Jesus sitting under a fig tree and studying Torah. And that's actually a Hebrew idiom that usually meant someone was wealthy. It's kind of like if I said, you know, that uh, so-and-so was born with a silver spoon in their mouth. It's like that. You don't take that literally. You take it as, say, a, a, you know, a picture of, of what kind of class that they come from. And Jesus intentionally reached out to a guy named Matthew, too. Matthew was a Levite, which was from the priestly tribe, but he would have been considered a total sellout. Anybody know why? He was a tax collector. An IRS agent for the Romans. Yeah, that, that wasn't good. Jesus also intentionally included a guy named Simon, and do you know what his nickname was? There's a Simon Peter. This is the other Simon. It's kind of like the Bobs. This is, this is one of the other Bobs. Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot. And Jesus also had another disciple who was probably a Zealot's Zealot. Anybody know what we think of as the last name of a guy named Judas? Iscariot. Iscariot. So that comes to us from the Greek. When you flip the lens into Hebrew, it could mean one of two things. He was from a town in Israel called Keriot. Or the more likely of the two, it's related to a word, skari, S-C-A-A-R-I. Up later if you'd like. It's a subset within the Zealot party who carried out assassinations with a small curved dagger that could fit it into their tunic. And uh, if they saw some Roman official coming their way and no one was around, they could just take out the, uh, the, the curved dagger, gut them real quick, and within a few moments they dropped to the ground and you were, you know, a block away, walking with resolution. Yes. Um, so, you know, think, think of Think of a guy who was just, he had his, he was a card-carrying member of the NRA, had his concealed weapons permit. <laughs> that, that was Judas Iscariot. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an old song I thought of when I was thinking about Judas. Remember Bobby Darren, Mac the Knife? <laughs> oh, the shock <laughs> Everybody now. <laughs> You're no good. <laughs> um, so think of this, think of this. Jesus surrounded himself with a couple of one percenters, with an IRS agent, and a couple of terrorists who would have hated both the one percenters and the IRS. <coughs> and he managed to keep these guys from slitting each other's throats for at least three years. That's pretty miraculous. He also made such an impact that one of them finally couldn't take it anymore, Judas. And, uh, you know, did what Judas did. And the rest followed in his footsteps and sought after their own disciples, too. How did Jesus do it? So, this is the secret. This is the big takeaway today. Are you ready? All right. Jesus entered their stories. And he invited them to enter his story, too. And that order is so what's that look like for us? How do we find uncommon ground with others in these strange and perilous times? There's a book I've, I've just started reading. In fact, I'm going through it with some academic colleagues. It's called Difficult Conversations, How to Discuss What Matters Most. It's by the authors of uh, probably a better well-known book that you may have heard of called Getting to Yes. So this came out of the Harvard Business School. They wrote this book that exploded on the bestseller list. And getting to yes is kind of about having difficult conversations. But they wanted to dial that in a little better. And so they wrote this follow-up to that book. And, and it's, it's a wonderful book. Um, and in, in that book, they, they talk about a tale of two parades. But in real time, it was the same parade. And as I read it, I, I actually thought of the, the Rodi Festival parade. So imagine that there's a guy named Doug. And Uncle Doug has his little four-year-old nephew, Danny. And Danny loves trucks. So the roadie festival progresses in front of them. 
it's wonderful. Doug is ebullient, he's happy, he's, he's noting, you know, the wonderful happy people and they're throwing things into the crowd, candy and stuff like that. And he sees the beautiful rhododendrons and, and uh, you know, the, the clever sayings on the side of the floats and these horses that are going by, he sees all of that. And little Danny, the four-year-old, all he sees is not the floats, not the people, not the horses. He knows that there's some really cool trucks, <laughs> really, really cool trucks that are dragging the floats. So at the end of the day, Danny and Doug have this conversation. And Danny says, Uncle Doug, thanks for taking me to the roadie parade. It was wonderful. I loved it. And Uncle Doug says, I did too, Danny. And neither of them knows that they saw an entirely different parades. Life was a lot like that parade. So as I think about my friends who would resonate with what we call the religious right, let me invite you into their stories. So let me tell you a little bit about that kind of mindset. Let's talk about taking the Bible seriously versus taking the Bible literally. Uh, and again, there, there are evangelicals who land in both places. If you take it very literally, have you noticed that political conservatives often are originalists? Do you know what an originalist is? Does that term mean anything? An originalist, it's come up some in the, in the most recent uh, presidential election, and it came up a lot when uh, the Supreme Court vacancy occurred because of Justice Scalia's death. So originalists are people who think that the Constitution ought to be interpreted through the lens of our founding fathers and mothers. And a lot of more progressive liberal folks think that we can't really know what the lens of the original founding fathers is when it comes to things like net neutrality. You know, the idea that the internet ought to be free and equal and open to all. They didn't even know what electricity was. Except maybe Ben Franklin had that little kite thing. Uh, so, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about. Is this microphone on? Let's talk about gay rights. Where's one of your. Uh, where's, let me see that. So you see this hymnal, see how thick it is? Well, if you've ever seen a Christian Bible, it's maybe twice that thick, yeah? So out of those, I don't know, thousands of pages, 66 books, lots of books, lots of pages, there are six or seven passages that very conservative religious right folks point to as talking about gay rights. Six or seven little passages. And I used to teach what's called hermeneutics, which is talking about how to interpret scripture. And more than looking at things just literally, you look at the context, and you look at the understanding that people would have had in their day. What was going on at the time? And there's lots of reasons to think differently about things like that. Especially when the biblical record is so scary. Let's talk about evolution. You just you just let a scientist into your fellowship today. <laughs> Imagine the possibilities. I'll change you all. <laughs> so you may know that uh, there are those within the evangelical camp who uh, you know cast a dim view on evolution. And uh, they talk about how it's only a theory, kind of like gravity. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's because of this very literalistic reading, and they, they fail to see that the Genesis narrative is a very ancient narrative, not unlike something that might have been told around the Native American campfire at some point in our history in America. So it, it, it doesn't mean it isn't true, but it's not true that way. It's deeply true. It's telling us something about ourselves and our relationship to one another and our relationship to the universe. It doesn't have to
to necessarily be, you know, six days and that was it. And 6,000 years ago and that was it. Um, there's another way that I want to invite you into their stories, and that's to think about, you know, what I said about Billy Graham, focusing on, on the inner life. So that kind of sociologically has taken on aspects of thinking about the religious right, thinks about things in terms of personal responsibility. Um, there's a, a book and a, a, a German scholar named Max Weber, Max Weber, who wrote a book called The Protestant Work Ethic that traces, you know, the growth of the early days of capitalism and its growth to early Protestants and uh, their, their desire to, to prove that they were, you know, the, the chosen ones. Um, and it, it's that whole sense of, of personal responsibility. So when you see some news outlet, uh, like one that some guy just recently was thrown out of, and incessantly every, you know, October, November, December, they, they trumpet the war on Christmas. Um, when you hear talk radio, you know, some guy named Rush, or when you look at particular websites like The Blaze, and when that's all you see and all you read and all you hear, you know, that, that notion of personal responsibility can start to go a little too far. And you start taking your sense of personal responsibility and imposing it on everybody else. Yes? So, that's some insight into, you know, kind of an intramural fight within evangelicalism right now. So, I already told you the big takeaway. Jesus found a way to, end, to enter the stories of others and invited them into his. But let's talk about some bite-sized takeaways really quickly. Um, let's, let's break it down. So, first thing I can say is, you should go first. You should go first. So, a liberal person has a big frame of reference, and a conservative person has a much narrower frame of reference. So, I am sorry, but it is up to you to start this conversation, because you can see things that include this frame of reference, because you can see way out here, too. So, you go first. Just seek to understand where they're coming from and why. Uh, secondly, recognize that these are generally awesome people. In their own frame of reference, so the way that they think about things, there's some internal consistency for them. And their, their uh, money and their energies are directed in great ways. So I know a lot of evangelical friends, the religious right, and they practice what's called tithing. And if you're a really conservative, theological, religious right person, if you're a tither, you literally give at least 10% of your gross income away to charity every year. That's a lot. That's pretty crazy. Um, you know, there are folks in the religious right who take their pro-life stance, what they call pro-life, they take that very seriously, and they practice a, lots of adoptions. I know families that have 12, 14 kids. So whatever we might think of that stance, and whether it's right or wrong, we can appreciate that it's consistent within their worldview, and they're doing what they can, consistent with their worldview, to make the world a better place. Also, read what they're reading. Watch what they're watching. Listen to what they're listening. Enter their story, and invite them to do the same. That'll blow their minds. Hey, turn off Fox News, turn on MSNBC. You know, imagine, imagine what could happen. Um, always engage as a person and not as a position. If I know you are only coming at me to try and change my mind, I am not going to be very responsive. But if, if we're people enjoying a relationship, that's awesome. I mentioned a moment ago, and I want to say it again, they have a worldview that is internally consistent. Uh, there's a, there's a, an evangelical author I like who talks about what he calls brickianity. Brickianity. It's a very conservative worldview that is just like this. It all sticks together. And if you start pushing on any of those bricks and it looks like that brick might fall out, it creates a real dissonance for them. And that's why they get very reactive. You know, if, if, if evolution is true, then the Bible is a lie. And Jesus never existed. And God isn't real. It's, it's that kind of, kind of a thing uh, for, for, for some of them. Um, 
you know, it's, it's that notion of mystery versus certainty. Uh, many on the religious right are very certain, and they forget that faith is really a lot about mystery. So be mindful of that. Also, this is a relationship and not a debate. It's a relationship and not a debate. I love the size of Florence. It's a really great reminder that these people that we're talking to today, we're going to see at Freddy's tomorrow, or at the FEC, or Bymart, or Safeway. And it's a good reminder, you know, that this is a long-term thing. You know, we're not just having this moment, this, this crisis moment where I'm going to try and change your mind. This is a, a long-term process. And the last thing I'll say about that, this is really dangerous work. Jesus had a great track record, 11 out of 12. But that 12th guy betrayed him and got him killed. <laughs> Real relationships are not for the faint of heart. Ask my wife of 36 years. <laughs> so, can I give you a quick benediction just to close my section? So my friends, while you may not be a follower of Jesus, may you follow the example of Jesus in these ways. May you be brave and courageous slow to anger and quick to forgive. May you wage peace with a heart full of love. May you always be wise and may you be wily when necessary. May you ever find ways to enter the stories of others and invite them into yours. Amen. Thank you.